the service of the temple, they were really blessed, but they were also rebellious. And so the Christians, many of them Gentiles, they asked this question in verse 9, what then, are we better than they? In other words, they really blew it. Yeah, but God is not done with them. Sorry, I got to turn off my phone here. I thought I did. Okay. What then, are we better than they? And Paul says, not at all. Remember, he's talking about the unredeemed. For we have already charged that who? Both Jews and Greeks, that's another way of saying Gentiles, that's non-Jews, are all under what? Are all under the curse of sin. This is the natural man. This is the hardest thing to convince people of. When you're sharing the gospel and you're talking to people about Christ, you know, a lot of people tell you, hey, I'm good. I go to church. I'm a good person. You know, you need to talk to my neighbor. That's a bad guy, but I'm good. And you know what? They're not good. They're not good because every man is under the curse of sin. Others, maybe they sin a little bit more, but we're all under the curse of sin, and that's what man doesn't realize. Somehow they, they're taking a gamble that God will look at their good works would outweigh their bad works. It, it's just ridiculous. They're not understanding God's perfect righteousness. God does not compare us with other people. He compares us with his son, the perfect righteousness of Christ. We see something very similar here. Go with me to Luke chapter 13 where, where Jesus is answering a question regarding these people who died in such a horrible way. In Luke chapter 13, remember this? Jesus is talking to Jewish men and women in Luke chapter 13, verse 1, and he's answering a question for them because the Jewish mindset is when something terrible happens to you, there's a direct correlation to something that you've done. Now, sometimes that's true, but not all the time. If you look at John chapter 9, he says, Lord, who sinned, this man's father or this man that he was born blind? You know what Jesus says? Neither. So that the, the works of God may be seen in this man. God has a purpose and a plan and a will. We don't always know what that is. And so here we have Jesus answering the question regarding these people who died in a terrible way. And Jesus makes it very clear, you're no different. Look at Luke chapter 13, verse 1. It says here in Luke 13, 1, Now on the same occasion were some, um, there were some present who reported to him, to Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now, we don't know what happened. Uh, we just know that Pilate came in and killed these people. They were probably rebellious. We don't know. And somehow during their sacrifices, maybe in the temple there, they were killed and their blood was mingled with the sacrifices. And listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? You know what their answer would be? Yeah, they were bad guys. God must have, God knows what sin they were, they were involved with. You know what Jesus said? No. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And it's important for them to understand this. You are also under the curse of sin. You're no different than those people. They died this way, but guess what? Unless you repent, you're going to die. And you may die in a horrible way. He's calling them out to not think that you're better than other people. You know what we are? We're dust, aren't we? When you think yourself is better than somebody else, remember you are dust. Everything good that you have, God has given to you. Even our salvation, did you earn that? No. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And so we need to be humble and thankful. And when we see another person, even another brother or sister, we need to love them, pray for them, right? And so Jesus is calling out these people because they see themselves maybe better. Look at verse 3. Excuse me, verse 4. Jesus says, or do you suppose, again, talking about the history that happened back then, 
that those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? And what does he say? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What is Jesus saying? You're just as much a sinner as these people. You're in the same boat. You need to repent. These people, they can't repent anymore, right? Once they're gone, that's it. They can't repent. You're still alive. And you need to repent and surrender your life to Christ. And so, beloved, we have to be careful when we compare ourselves with other people. That's what the world does. That's what the natural man does. Not us. We're like, Lord, thank you for not giving me justice. The truth is, beloved, every one of us here deserves God's condemnation. Every one of us here, here deserves the lake of fire. Do you understand that? I mean, if you don't believe that, that you got to read the scripture. You don't understand the holiness of God. And so we have to understand that God has delivered us. And we see that uh, there is nobody better than others when it comes to, to uh, being sinners. Others are just greater sinners, right? But we all need salvation. So the question is whether we Christians or here Gentile Christians were better than these Jews. Since we do not, uh, you know, we do not bear the responsibility as the Jews. The Jews have the covenants, the oracles, the ancestry. And Paul says, no. Since we are all under the condemnation of sin. It doesn't matter, beloved, what culture what tongue, what tribe, what people, we all need the Lord, don't we? I like that Steve Green song, and, and I know I'm, some of you don't like, who's Steve Green? <laughs> A beautiful song says, people need the Lord. They need the Lord, right? The greatest need of man is the forgiveness of God. That's the greatest need of man. They need the forgiveness of God. The question is, do you have the forgiveness of God? Have you surrendered your life to Christ? Have you repented of your sin? See, when you stand before God, your wife is not going to be there with you or your friends or your brothers. You're going to stand alone before Almighty God. And you know what? Our only hope is Jesus, isn't it? Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. You know this, this passage. Ephesians chapter 2 what kind of people were we before we were saved? Well, we were children of not delight, children of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 1. Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus, and he says to them, And you were what? Dead, spiritually dead. We had no relationship with God. Every man is born this way. This is a precondition, isn't it? The only person that is sinless is Jesus. Every man is born a sinner. These little sinners become big sinners, right? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you were formerly, you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now is working in the sons of disobedience. That was us. Among them, we too all formally lived, how? In the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh. If you're living that way today, then friend, you're not saved. If you're living to please yourself and honor yourself, and it's all about you, then you know what? You have a God in your life. And it's not the true and living God, but it's yourself. So he says, this is the way we were. We were living in our lusts, indulging in our flesh, and the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, naturally, right? Children of what? A blessing? Nope. Children of wrath. See, that's the problem with man. He doesn't recognize God, and when he does recognize God, he runs away from him. That's the problem. So the natural man, the natural woman, is a child of wrath because they indulge in their own flesh. They're selfish, they're self-centered, 
everything revolves around them. And that's what we were. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Look at verse 4. But God, praise the Lord, God did not leave us that way. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive. See that? Together with Christ. Why and how? By grace, God's undeserved favor. By grace, you have been saved. It's an act of great mercy, isn't it? An act of great love. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's our position in Christ. Verse 7, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He's talking about those who are redeemed. And how were we redeemed? Because we're so good and we work so hard. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 8. For by grace, and I told you this before, salvation begins with God's sovereign grace. It begins with God. God says, I will have mercy in whom I will have mercy. We don't dictate to God. God is the one that dictates. And God is the one that chooses before the foundation of the world. In his sovereign grace, that's where salvation begins. And that's where Paul begins. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I mean, how many of you go to a birthday party and give a gift, say, okay, that's going to be $45. <laughs> That's not a gift, right? Salvation is a gift. I don't know, maybe some of you do. <laughs> or you tell them, right? I heard this one story where this guy, he bought gifts for this lady's, his girlfriend's parents, and he told them how much he paid for all the gifts. Like, why? That caused a girl to break up with him. But anyways. <laughs> and, and so that's not a gift, but when it comes to salvation, you know why it has to be a gift? Do you want to know why? Because it's priceless. We could never be good enough. It's priceless. What can equal the blood of Christ? Nothing. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which, Christ, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. And so, beloved, understand this, that God has not given us what we deserve, has he? What do we deserve? We deserve God's wrath. We deserve the lake of fire. And, and so when they ask Paul, you know, aren't we better off than they are? No, you're not. You're still under the condemnation of sin as everybody else. And we also need to repent. The Bible is very clear that, that the heart of man is so deceitful. This is why people believe they're good enough to go to heaven, because they're lying to themselves. In Jeremiah 17, it says that heart is so deceitful and desperately sick. If you trust your own heart, the Bible says you are what? You are a fool. That's what Hollywood does, right? Hollywood says, follow your heart. Yeah, people tell, tell you that, right? Follow your dreams. Follow your heart. You know what I say to you? Follow God's word. Follow the Lord. Honor God. Live for God. You're here for the glory of God, not for yourself. See, that's where you get it wrong. This is why so many people are so unhappy. Because they're living for themselves, striving for themselves, and things don't work out because it's all for themselves. When we should be living for God, surrender to the Lord and content wherever God has us. And so we have so many miserable, not only non-Christians, but even Christians. And I told you this before that when I was reading a book on John MacArthur, he says his, his Christian life changed. It changed. Even though he was a Christian, his Christian life changed when he consciously made the um, when he made the conscious decision to live for the glory of God as a Christian. 
See, not every Christian is doing that. Have you made the conscious decision as a Christian, Lord, I'm going to live for your glory. This is why I'm going to live. This is, what I'm, this is my whole life. This is my purpose in life. Lord, I'm going to live for your glory. Show me, Lord, what you have me to do. You know what? Your life will change, friend. It will change. This is why you were created. But a lot of people say, you know, I'm saved. I trust in Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. But you're not living for the glory of God. And you haven't made that commitment. You need to do that, friend. Because otherwise, you're going to be miserable. So we need to make that conscious decision. Go with me to Romans 8. We've seen this before, but this is so important that we understand. It's a whole different mindset, isn't it? The Christian mindset and the redeemed mindset versus those who are in the flesh and are unredeemed. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 5. Romans 8, verse 5. This is the redeemed and the unredeemed. The unredeemed are of the flesh, the redeemed are of the spirit. He says in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on what? On things above? No. But that's what it said in Colossians, where you and I should set our mind on things above. But when it comes to the, uh, those who are unredeemed, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. A person that lives for himself and is self-serving and self-centered and is all about pleasing himself, you know what? He doesn't have time for God. In fact, he runs away from God because he knows that it's going to spoil whatever he's trying to uh, accomplished for himself. The mind set in the flesh is death. The mind set in the spirit is life and peace. And the mind on the flesh, the mind set on the flesh is hostile, is an enemy of God. For it does not subject itself, say that word subject, like submit itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Can't because they're dead and their trespasses and sin. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is so important that we understand. You might say, I know an unbeliever, and he's a good person. He might, be a, he might do good things, right? Or there's people in these different religions, and they do good things, but they're still dead in their trespasses and sins. They, can't, they don't have their own righteousness. We need Christ's righteousness, don't we? This is so important. The mind set in the flesh is hostile towards God. That's the natural man. So every man, doesn't matter, rich or poor, religious or an atheist, educated, uneducated, in bondage or free, we all need the gospel. We all need deliverance. We all need to be redeemed. So let me ask you a question. Have you been redeemed? Are you born again? Have you surrendered your life to Christ? Have you repented of your sin? Are you trusting in Christ as your Savior and as your Lord? I hope you are, because he's the only one. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. There's not another Savior. There's only one Savior. There's only one God and one Son of God, and it's Christ. There's only one mediator between God and man. And that man, Jesus Christ, is the one. We need Jesus, don't we? Go back with me to Romans chapter 3. So we see then that man, uh, every man has this in common. Every man has this in common. And we can, we can thank our great-great-grandpappy Adam, you know, because he, uh, he sinned. But you know what? Again, it was a part of God's overall plan, though God himself... Uh, is not the author of sin. And God has provided for us a lamb, hasn't he? Now let's go to verses 10 to 18. Paul begins to now share this indictment against man. He begins to describe his character, his conversation, and his conduct. This is the unredeemed soul. And you might say, well, you know what? When, you know, I'm not like that. Trust me, you are in your heart. 
if you haven't done this outwardly. And so Paul began to describe what man really is like. This is the picture of the natural man. This is the mirror, isn't it? In Romans chapter 3, look at verse 10. Paul writes, as it is written, that's a, a source of authority. And what Paul begins to do, he begins to quote the scripture. You know why? Because Paul himself is showing the authority. Our final authority is the word of God. And so Paul points to the scripture. He points to the scripture. And most of the scripture from here is from Psalms. He uses a little bit of Ecclesiastes, a little bit of Isaiah, but most of it is from the book of Psalms. Shows you the authority of even the poetic books. And what does it say? Verse 10, as it is written, there is what? Why is that so important? The theme of the book of Romans is the righteousness of God. Man doesn't have it. Man does not have the righteousness of God. That has to be given. We cannot earn the righteousness of God. We cannot work hard enough. We need Christ and him crucified, buried, and resurrected. Christ is the end of the law, isn't he? In other words, he's the goal of the law. For with the law, as we read earlier, is the knowledge of sin. And so what does Paul say? There is nobody righteous. In other words, nobody deserves the forgiveness of God. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. There is none righteous, not even one. You're not the exception. I'm sorry. You're just not it, right? And, and that's what he, he's saying so clearly. And he goes on to say, there is none who understands there is none who seeks for God. The natural man does not seek for God. The natural man runs away from God. You ever wonder why there's so many religions? Many of those religions are really turning away from God and his truth. So man makes his own religion. It's going away from the true God that's been revealed to them. And so we see that they show no, a lack of understanding. They show that when it comes to seeking God, they run away from God. Look at verse 12. All have turned aside. See, they have the truth and they turn aside from it. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. Not in God's eyes. The best a man has, you know what they are to God? You, you know what it says in Isaiah. They're like filthy rags. And I told you what filthy rags there means. It's poo bad it's the rags that women use in menstrual cycles that's the rags it's talking about that's pretty bad but that's what it means it is filthy it is bad and that's the best that man has it's not good enough and so it says here then that uh, there's not even one and then he talks about their conversation their throat is an open grave. There's just decay, right? With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And then now their conduct, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. And verse 18 tells you why. Why are people like this? Why do people go on to do evil, wicked things? Why? Don't they know that God sees and God's going to judge them? What does it say in verse 18? There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's man's great mistake. You know what I pray for when I pray for someone's salvation? Lord, I pray that they will fear you. Because there will be a day that they will stand before you, and you know what? It will be too late. Someday we will stand before Almighty God. You know what happened when Job, when God came to Job, and the whirlwind, and Job saw God? You know what Job did? He had nothing to say. He was overwhelmed by the majesty and the glory and the power of the Lord. And so will every single person will be overwhelmed by the majesty and the glory and the holiness of God. We're going to do this. There's no boldness before God. 
And so Job says, I have nothing to say. I'm just, remember, we're just dust. And someday we'll stand before God. And the problem is that man does not fear the Lord. We talked about that in chapter 2, where we see that man is ungodly, doesn't fear the Lord. So this is the character of character of the natural unredeemed person paul in order to expose the universal problem of all men he uses the inspired scriptures again mostly from the psalms to indict all men everywhere of their sin even after they have received the general revelation of god which is creation and the special revelation of god which is the scriptures even specifically the law and even man's own conscience the commandments of God are written on their heart. And, and Paul begins to expose their corruption. So when you're talking to an unbeliever and you're sharing the gospel, you know what? They're a sinner. And only God, by his Holy Spirit, can open their heart for them to understand that they need a Savior. See, we just have to get the gospel right. See, our responsibility, first of all, I can't save anybody, neither can you. We can pray for them. We can ask God to open their heart, but we just have to give them a clear gospel message and let the Holy Spirit do His work. That's all we can do, and just pray. And you know what? Leave it in God's hands. And if you have more opportunities to share the gospel, then do it. One of the most effective ways to share the gospel is through a personal testimony. That would be great. To share with people how God has changed your life, right? I mean, how are they going to combat that? Well, no, he didn't change your life. No, he didn't change your heart. No, you don't love him. You know what I'm saying? So you're not dealing so much with, um, with, um, with just facts outside of yourself. You're, you're telling what God has done for you. Isn't that the, what the woman at the well did? Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did, Right? Could this, this couldn't be the Christ, could it? So we share our own personal testimony and hopefully we are able to share the gospel with them. And you know what? I think it, it's pretty effective, but it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel. We have to get the gospel right. So what does the word of God say? Go with me to Psalm 14. This is where a lot of this came from. Psalm 14, go with me there. The natural man, he's lost, so lost. And you, they might be polite, they might be, like I said, cultured, educated. They're just as lost as a person in the street, right? They need the Lord just as much. Psalm 14. Look at verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1 says the fool has said in his heart there is no god why is he such a foolish person because what he's doing is he's suppressing the truth he's stating he's rejecting the obvious he's looking at creation he's looking at divine design he looks in the microscope he sees divine design his conscience bothers him he knows what's right and wrong and then he still suppresses that and says there's no god that's because of his sin he loves his sin. So he's a fool, isn't he? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, David goes on to say, they are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. And you know what the natural man does? He doesn't seek after God. Because to seek after God is to seek after truth. And basically, they, you know, it, it's so important that people understand. They know that if they put their trust in God, their whole life needs to change. And they're accountable to God. I've literally talked to people and shared the gospel with them. And it wasn't like they didn't believe what I was saying what they told me was, you know, I know what you're saying, and I know what you're saying is true, but I'm not ready to do that because I got this on the side. You know, this one guy was selling drugs, and he was in the gang, and he says, you know what, I know what you're saying is true, but I'm not ready to do it. So what he was doing is basically he understood 
but he rejected it. And that really, it just, it just hurt me when he said that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Please understand, beloved, we cannot change anybody's heart. Husbands and wives, you want to change your wife's life, your wife's heart, and husbands uh, or wives, you want to change your husband's heart? You can, but God can. If you pray for them and seek God and ask God to change their heart, God can do it. We can't do it. We can try to argue with them. We can try to try to deal with them. We cannot change their heart and their mind. The Holy Spirit can. And so we have to pray for them, right? So there's no one who does good. Psalm 14, verse 2, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the sons of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. Verse 3, They have all turned aside, aside from the truth, aside from God. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so that's why we need Jesus. Go with me to Psalm 36. Again, the depravity of man. We all need the Lord. And if you are redeemed, you've been born again, you know what? It's because someone shared the gospel with you. Someone was faithful to share the gospel with you and you got opened your heart like Lydia on the outskirts of Philippi and God opened your heart to the gospel and he saved you through the gospel. Psalm 36 verses 1 through 4. What does it say here? Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. And what do they say to themselves? There is, there is no fear of God before his eyes. For it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. See that type of person? That type of person, he's just filling up his cup of wrath. And many times, these, these type of people, they don't live very long because a judgment of God does fall on them. But you might say, well, I know people, and sometimes you see this, that person was so wicked and they lived so long. That's, that's the only peace they're ever going to have. They go from the frying pan into what? Into the fire. And so we have to understand that the natural man, they are just wicked and self-centered. And even though they see the truth, they suppress it, don't they? That's what the Word of God says. They suppress the truth. And the mindset on the flesh is only hostile towards God. Romans 1, go back with me there. Going back to what we just finished reading uh, a couple of weeks ago in Romans 1. What does it say there? Starting in verse 18, the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven. First of all, we see it in the Old Testament, right? We see it in the scriptures. We see it in many times, uh, the natural consequences. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It's been revealed from heaven. In other words, it's, it comes from God. God reveals it to man. You do something bad, you're going to pay the consequences, right? It, it hopefully starts in the home, right? It starts in the home with mom and dad. You do something. My kids learned, right? My kids learned in first-time obedience. In fact, um, I don't know if you remember this program. It was an old program by a guy named Ezo. It was called Growing Kids God's Way. And they taught that you talk to your child one time. And uh, you tell them, you explain it to them. You tell them one time. The second time they violate, they get a spanking. Boom. Right? First time obedience. That's really important. And so we learn then that we learn the, the, you learn God's discipline starting at home. Right? And here it says the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven to all men. If you ever read the scriptures, it comes from God. 
And it's been revealed to men, men uh, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They know the truth, they suppress it. Look at verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Their conscience, creation, the microscope, right? What about even personal testimony from other people that share the gospel with them? That's another testimony. Look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, or in a sense knew about him, right? Not intimately or personally, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. They did not want to give an account to God, so they had to make up their own, um, their own stories about creation. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. That's the natural man. And that's the character of man, isn't it? Man, uh, he turns a blind eye to God and he starts making up things for himself. And, uh, and, and, and we see here that these people are without excuse. And so it's important that, we, that you understand that when we share the gospel with people, this is a natural state of man. So it doesn't matter who these people are. You know, sometimes we think, and I just had someone talk to me about this, these, these people that are really religious and, and, uh, and, and they're not Christians, but uh, that person believed that, you know, maybe they know God. And I said, no, they don't. They don't know God. Remember that salvation is only through Christ. It's not through a religion. It's not through good works. And I told her, you know what? They need to be saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It doesn't matter what they, you know, what, what, what else they believe, but that's the only way they'll be saved. And so we tell people that, that uh, as, as nice as they may be, right, um, they still need Christ. They still need the forgiveness of God. The natural man runs away from God he runs away from God by false religion. He runs away from God by ignoring the truth, just like that one gentleman did, right? So let me ask you, are you running away from God? I remember one time I was having, um, we we're having a breakfast with men in, in, in our church one time, and this one guy came in and someone invited him and he came and he sat down and he said, he goes, yeah, he says, I feel like Jonah, he says. I feel like Jonah, I, I, he says, I keep running away from God. God wants me to do certain things, but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just running away from him. You know what that is? That's just rebellion. That's just rebellion. And, and he was so miserable when he was saying it. He was such a miserable person. And, and so, I, you know, I was a young Christian then, and I'm thinking, you're running away from God. He's, he goes, yeah, I think God really wants to use me, but I, and I, could, I could sense that he wants to use me, but I keep running away from him. And I'm thinking, you're just being rebellious. You know, you look back in retrospect, right? Retrospect is always 2020. I should have questioned his salvation. You know, he knew the truth because clearly he did. He knew the truth, but he was not submitting to the truth. You see, there's an issue right there. Submission. Rebellious man is so prideful. They will not submit to the authority of God. And they have no fear of God. That's a problem. You know, when you look at the false teachers in the book of, um, of Second Peter, even in Jude, you know what? The, one of the issues with the false teachers is they hate authority. That's the natural man. You wonder why your children get rebellious towards you? They hate authority. You wonder why you don't like people telling you what to do? You hate authority. Well, guess what? God is your authority. And the word of God is our final authority, isn't it? And God has put other authorities over you. If you have a husband, that's your authority. If you're a child, you have parents, that's your authority. And if you don't like submitting to that authority, then the problem is with you. 
Understand this, ladies and children, right? And men, we have authority. Christ ultimately is our authority. But when you rebel against authority, you are rebelling against the Lord. And so we see here that the natural man is running away from God. They're running away from his authority. Man wants to be, in his, own, be his own authority. And that's what you have, beloved. So when it comes to man's character, it's corrupt. When it comes to man's conversation, it's corrupt. When it comes to man's conduct, it's corrupt. And the cause? There is no fear of God. You know, if we don't have fear of the Lord, we will have fear. I'd rather bow my knee now. What about you? I'd rather bow my knee now and fear the Lord now than later when it's too late. Right? Because it will be too late. Go back with me to Romans 3. So you see how Paul is painting this picture? He's, he's sharing both, both with the uh, Jews and the Gentiles. He's telling them, look, we're all under the curse of sin. We all need forgiveness. We all need salvation. We all need the gospel. We all need deliverance. Every man is in the same boat. And praise God, God has provided a lamb, hasn't he? He says here in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, Paul makes it very clear. Verse 19 of chapter 3, he says this. I got to turn there. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Now you might say, well, he sounds like he's talking about the Mosaic law. Yeah, he's talking about the Mosaic law. But there's also the law that's written on the hearts of men. So in other words, the law, period, condemns men, doesn't it? Reveals men's sin. So that all the world may be accountable to God. It doesn't matter if we reject uh, God's authority or what we do with it. We will stand before God and give an account. Doesn't the Bible say that? It is appointed for man to die once, and after this, what? Judgment. Nobody can escape that. And that's why we had our Lord Jesus. If you're redeemed, he took upon himself our judgment, hasn't he? He says in verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's what the law is, it's like a mirror, isn't it? No one was found worthy I'm sorry, no one is, um, Paul makes it clear that every single individual under God's law, whether it be the written law or the law written upon man's heart, every single human being except for Christ, of course, stands guilty before a holy, righteous God. Every single person. Nobody is worthy of God's mercy. Remember that scene in, in Revelation 5? Go with me there, Revelation 5. In Revelation 5, we have God the Father sitting on the throne, and he has a scroll in his hand. Remember that? And it's believed that the scroll, not only are the judgments that are going to come on the earth, but it's like the title deed of all the earth. And he has it in his hand. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, and... Uh, and so he's, they're looking for the person that is worthy to take the scroll from the Father's hand. Remember that? Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. John writes, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And it's not good news. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? They need somebody sinless. They need somebody worthy. They need a champion. But who is worthy? And you know what happened? Everything went silent. As the angel cried, cried out, who is worthy? And um, verse 3, and no one, see that? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. What does that tell you? 
we're all under judgment. We're all sinners. Nobody's worthy. Nobody's worthy of God's forgiveness. Nobody is worthy. Nobody's perfect. We all fall short. And what did John begin to do? Look at verse 4. He began to cry. I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. He's like, oh, this is so sad. It is sad. Verse 5. But there's good news, isn't there? And his name is Jesus. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to, he, to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb. Isn't that interesting how John, this is after Christ has already come, suffered and died and rose again. And when John looks, what does he see? A lamb. I think that God for all eternity wants us to remember the lamb, the sacrifice. This is really important. And so John sees this. In verse 6, he sees a lamb standing as if slain. Isn't that amazing? Having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came, and what did he do? He took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Oh, the lamb is worthy. It takes God, doesn't it? God himself has to come, and he's worthy and he is the one who redeems us. Look at verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. Now, by the way, if you and I bow down to another man and worship him, that's blasphemous. And here these men, these elders, are bowing down before the Lamb. What are they singing? Worthy are you to take the book, to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. You see, we're not worthy, but we have a worthy one, don't we? We're not sinless, but we do have a sinless one, the Lamb of God, our Savior. And so, beloved, in Jesus Christ, we identify with Christ through God's grace, through faith. We, um, we identify with Christ. He has clothed us in his righteousness and so we see here then only Christ is right, is worthy. We're not worthy, but he's worthy. And we always point to our Savior. Go with me to Romans 11. In Romans 11, we see that God has made sure that everybody is basically um, found guilty in his sight. It's important that we understand that because there's no one that is... Um, that is worthy. There is no one that is sinless, only our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 11, Paul is talking about the, uh, both the Jews and the Gentiles. In Romans 11, verse 28, Romans 11, verse 28, and he says this, And he's talking about the nation of Israel, okay? And he's talking to, to the church in Rome regarding the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel had rejected her Messiah, but it's only going to be a temporary rejection until the Messiah comes back for a second time. And he says this in Romans chapter 11, verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies. Right now, they don't know the Lord. For your sake, you Gentiles, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. God still loves Israel, the nation. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He's talking about Israel. God's calling to them 
And God's gifts of them, they're irrevocable. God's going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, it's going to happen. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. So we learn then that, that the door was closed for them, at least for a short time. They are put on the shelf. Even though individual Jews were coming to Christ, and the doors are open to the Gentiles, we see that, that God has a plan with all of this, doesn't he? He says in verse 32, For God has shut up all, see that? In what? In disobedience. Both Gentiles and, and uh, Greeks and Jews, they're all under disobedience, all under the curse of sin. Look at, verse, look at the second part of the verse. So that he, God, may show mercy to all. That's part of God's plan, wasn't it? God never is, is, is in heaven saying, oh, I didn't expect that to happen. Oh, that was an accident. There are no accidents with God. And so God, this whole thing with Christ coming and suffering and dying, this was all a part of God's divine design. We talked about that last week, remember? God is not the author of sin, but he orchestrates all things together for his glory. For us, who are, who are beloved and are redeemed, he orchestrates all things for our good. He's not the author of sin, but he will orchestrate all things, won't he? We have to understand that. And so we see here that when it comes to both Jews and Gentiles, all of them, all of them are, are under the curse of sin. And, uh, and it's the law that brings us all under the curse of sin. Romans 3.23, as you know, the Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, the first step of a person getting saved is what? Is to understand that they're a sinner, right? That's why the holiness of God is so important. We share that with people. That God is perfect, that God is holy, that God is just, and God will judge sinners. He will. The Bible says in, in Psalm 7, verse 11, that every day that God is a just judge, and every day God is angry with the wicked. It amazes me when people say, well, you know, God's not mad. No, he is. Sin makes him mad. And people are under a curse. And, and so we need to understand that, that um, people are going to pay. So the first step for a person to, to really get serious help is to admit they're a sinner. I mean, isn't that the same about drug addicts and, 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 and alcoholics, right? They say the first step for an alcoholic to get help is to admit they're an alcoholic. The first step of a person who is a, a drug user is to admit that they have a problem. But when they, they're, they're in denial, right, and they say, I don't have a problem, I can quit any time, then that person is never going to be helped. It is the same thing as a sinner. Before a person can get saved, the first thing they have to admit that is they're a sinner and they need a savior. And that's what we have to share with the world. And uh, they're not happy when they, you tell them that. Let me ask you a personal question. Have you admitted to God that you're a sinner? Or do you still see yourself as a good person? That somehow you're gonna earn your way to heaven. That's what most religions teach. Have you repented from your sins? Are you trusting in Christ as your Savior alone? And Savior and, and Lord? Let me just close with this. This is a short sermon, isn't it? Have you thought about where you will spend eternity? I mean, I love talking to college kids about this. You know, they're so in their academics and hanging out and doing whatever they're doing. And I say, have you thought about eternity? Most college kids, they don't think past the next week, you know, or their next final. They're like... You know, they're, they're just thinking about how they're going to get through this semester. You know, they just don't think about those things. But this is such an important question. Have you thought about where you will spend eternity? Have you really honestly thought about that? Or are you going to stick your head in the sand? If you die today, are you sure that you would go and be with the Lord in paradise? As you told the sinner on the cross? Or maybe you're not sure. 
The Bible is so clear, isn't it? The Bible is so clear that everyone has sinned against God. Every man has broken God's commandments. Every one of us have fallen short of God's, God's glory. We've learned that uh, in the last few chapters, we just learned that not even here, we learned not even one man, um, uh, there is none that is righteous, not even one. Man doesn't have his own righteousness. And here's a, sad, here's a sad commentary. Most people, most people that die will be cast into the lake of fire. Isn't that a sad commentary? But you and I, we don't have to go there. The Bible says, for it's appointed for man to die once and after this is judgment. I told you this already, that man's greatest need is the forgiveness of God. Man not only needs God's forgiveness, he needs God's deliverance from the wrath to come. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, as Paul is writing to the Roman church, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's talking to the church. Beloved, please understand this. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life holy life didn't he because he's god almighty in the flesh second person in the trinity he lived a perfect holy life on this earth and when jesus died he died a substitutionary death that's why he's called the lamb of god he died for sinners he was buried and on the third day he rose again in power conquering the grave and and you know this very very famous verse john three sixteen. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So let me ask you a very personal question. If you haven't done this already, will you repent today? Will you repent and ask Christ to save you? Will you do that today? To save you from the lake of fire? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. That's the call of salvation. That's a cry of salvation. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you made, have you cried out to the Lord? You see, there's no room for pride there, right? We're just, we're dust and we're sinful and we need a savior. Oh, we need to cry out to the Lord and we need to repent. And trust in Christ. Well, I'm going to pray and have Brother Steve come up. Let's pray and ask God to, to help us to retain all of this. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we know that you have delivered us. Father, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Father, we cannot, we cannot save ourselves. But Lord, you, you invaded the darkness that we were living in. Somebody shared the truth of your gospel with us. You opened our hearts and you helped us to trust by your grace through faith to trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. You have redeemed us. You have saved us. And Father, we thank you so much for giving us what we don't deserve. Thank you, Father, for not giving us justice, but for giving us mercy. Thank you for loving us so much that you have done that. We are just so grateful. And now, Father, we ask you may bless us and, and Lord, uh, bring us back again, Father, to be under your word and keep us close to you, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, we have some uh, birthdays coming up this week. We had one last week was uh, little Dessa. Um, forgive me, we uh, missed our uh, announcements last week. We got caught up in our um, communion service and both the pastor and I uh, missed it. So please forgive us. But little Dessa, she was, her birthday was last week. We got three coming up this week. We got Beth on Wednesday. We got Miss Sylvia, I believe on Thursday. And then we have Vivian on Friday, I believe. So. Wish them a happy birthday when you have the opportunity. 
Um, also, Wednesday is Veterans Day. Uh, please thank a veteran when you have the opportunity. And please, uh, gentlemen and women, if you have ever served in the United States military, please stand so we can recognize you. <clears throat> can, you uh, can you tell us which branch of service you served in? National Guard. Tommy? United States Navy. Jim? United States Navy. Amen. Dylan? All right. Roy? Amen. <laughs> the world's finest Navy, right? The world's finest Air Force and the National Guard. I serve the United States Navy myself. So thank you, gentlemen, for your, your service. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Sunday evening, our pastor is preaching through the book of Acts, through chapter 5, verses 1 through uh, chapter 1, 11, verse 11, purging sin from the church. Uh, also, Wednesday nights, we have uh, praise and prayer night, so come out and join us. We need more prayer warriors. We start at 6.30, have a little devotional message from our pastor, and then we uh, take praise and prayer requests, and we break up into groups and pray over those praise and prayer requests. Um, Friday night Bible study, on the Friday at 6.30, they have a little favorite food and light dinner before the study, and then they come in, we come in here and uh, do our Bible study from 7 p.m. on. All are welcome, so come out and join us, folks. Uh, tuition is needed for our brother Mario. If uh, Please consider being in prayer over that, um, helping him with his bill to uh, the Master's Theological Seminary. It's at $2,700, and that does not include the books. So the church is adding some money to that, but if you can help out, it would be greatly appreciated. We're seeking volunteers to clean our church. If you're interested in participating in that ministry, um, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and uh, you have uh, any questions about that, you can see Miss Elizabeth. There's a sign-up sheet for that in the hallway. Online giving, you can go to your computers, follow the prompts, and uh, donate to FCF. Prayer requests lift up our church, our pastor, his family, uh, replacing the trailer in the back, our parking lot, and the financial needs of our country, uh, financial needs of our church. And on that regard, please be in prayer about that. Our offerings are down a little bit, about a little bit. So please be praying uh, that uh, um, about that. If the Lord leads you, uh, donate to the church, our country, our military, our law enforcement, our first responders, and the persecuted church. Um, we'd also like to uh, thank all who came out yesterday. We had about uh, 18 volunteers yesterday come out and we cleaned up the church around here, did a lot of things. So we want to thank you for what you've done. Anything else, Pastor? Okay, I'll leave it to you. Let's all stand for prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for redeeming us, dear Father. Father, we thank you for sending our Lord Jesus Christ into this sinful world, and you came and um, you, you gave uh, your son to us as a sin offering and as a lamb. And, and Father, by your grace through faith in Jesus, we are forgiven, we are saved, and our names are written in heaven by your grace through faith. So, Father, we're just so grateful and so thankful that you have delivered us and saved us. Well, Lord, help us to uh, show our appreciation, our love for you by serving you, living for you, honoring you. Lord, that we would make that conscious decision, as I mentioned earlier, to live our lives to glorify you, to honor you. So, Lord, this is the only life that you, uh, I, I believe this is a life that is blessed. And, Father, we want your blessing. And bless us now, Father, as we depart, and give us a good week, Lord. Draw us near to you. We pray and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.